Hi everyone, um, welcome along to uh, the third and final session of day two of the uh, Biocommons 2021 showcase. I wanted to welcome you all to the BioCloud session. Um, my name is Dr. Stephen Menos. I am the Associate Director of Cyber Infrastructure at the Australian Biocommons. And I have an assemblage of wonderful um, colleagues and uh, um, collaborators who are gonna be uh, sharing ideas and uh, things we're doing together around this idea of the BioCloud. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians uh, on whose traditional lands we meet. And for me, that is the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nations. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I say this message on behalf of all the speakers who are participating in this session in the next hour. We have a really packed and great agenda today um, from um, a range of collaborators and um, I'll really just get straight into it with a short introduction about the idea of the BioCloud. So I'll start off by saying that this uh, very deliberate blank slide is the experience that researchers or users um, of computational infrastructure have of the computational landscape when they start. It's a blank, slate it's full of unknown unknowns they don't often know what they don't know and they're also not really sure where to start some researchers might have visibility of parts of a map of what's available you can imagine that this view might be a common one for researchers that use galaxy or nci the map of what's available to you tends to be very localized and very limited in scope Here's another possible view um, where researchers might be getting data from the BPA data portal and analyze it, analyzing it on their institutional HPC facilities. But the reality is, is that there is a map which we as the Biocommons and the collective understand deeply now, but it is a complex ecosystem. It has a lot of moving parts and really it results in mass confusion because it's down to individual researchers to do the head scratching of how do I get access? How do I move data? How do I manage my identities across all these things? And in a sense, researchers need to be the network switch um, to make these things interoperate, to make these things talk to one another. And the challenge is that this mass confusion results in limited adoption and ultimately limited value is derived from this map of investments that honestly probably cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build. So our response to this complexity is the BioCloud program. And in short, the BioCloud aims to create an integrated set of services adapted for life sciences research, underpinned by infrastructure and expertise in Australia and internationally. The way we think about the BioCloud is with this BioCloud framework. On the right here, I think we're very familiar with the fact that policies and processes in front of computers like at NCI and PAUSI um, provide capacity to these systems. And that capacity, the compute, the data storage is provided to you. But bioinformatics is data intensive. It is distributed, it involves distributed people, it's multi-tool, it's multi-language, it's got distributed compute, distributed data sources, products, and distributed data stores as well. So we end up with all these other things on the left-hand side as well. And it's really left to the researcher to sort all these things out on the left. Capacity that's shaped for bioinformatics is the starting point, but obviously a lot more is needed. We need to put products and foundation technologies on top of capacity, and we need to evolve and adapt policies and processes to better align with life sciences. This framework is how we structure our efforts in the BioCommons um, and uh, in the BioCloud, and many um, of which you've heard through the course um, of the BioCommons Showcase and others you're gonna hear about over the next 45 or 50 minutes. I'll just conclude my intro here to say that the BioCloud has at its core these three key strategies, which we're gonna be touching on to various degrees in the next hour. Number one, we're gonna adapt services for use by Australian bio bioinformatics, adding layers of functionality, access and capacity tuned to the needs of bioinformaticians. Number two, we're gonna create a uh, integrated ecosystem where we'll build roads between all these services using technologies in identity management and data movement amongst other things. 
And number three, this will all be driven by user needs. So our users can more intuitively map their data intensive research needs. So I'd encourage you to um, add any questions you have into the chat. And right now I'm gonna hand over to Ryan Fraser from Arnett, Manager of Research Infrastructure and, uh, and Engagement. Uh, thank you, Stephen. And uh, thank you everyone for, uh, uh, and particularly the BioCommons community for this uh, lovely in invite to participate in this uh, forum. Um, and uh, it's been an excellent opportunity for Arnett to be engaged with uh, the BioCommons. So it's a very progressive research community. Uh, and today I just wanted to present on some of the work that we've been doing with uh, the BioCommons in relation to uh, uh, working towards hosting Galaxy at Arnett. Uh, next slide, please, Stephen. Thanks for that. Uh, so today we're just gonna uh, cover off on some of the plans to operate uh, Galaxy at Arnett. Um, but firstly, who is Arnet? For those that don't know, Arnet owns and operates the academic, uh, Australian Academic Research Network uh, here in Australia, which is utilised by all the Australian universities and CSIRO, um, plus additional uh, research and education institutes across Australia. Uh, we're owned by the universities uh, and the CSIRO. Uh, we're a not-for-profit and we uh, live and work to effectively serve the, se uh, the sector in, in providing high bandwidth network security and cloud services. Um, but for today, what I'll be doing is covering off on our engagement here with the BioCommons and what we've been doing, particularly around uh, working towards hosting uh, the Galaxy uh, head node over at Arnet. Uh, we'll be looking at Arnet's sort of model there to support research uh, with e infrastructure. Um, the partnership itself with Galaxy and other areas that Arnet's currently working with the BioCommons to explore leveraging some of this stuff that we've got in, uh, out in the, in the sector, such as cloud store and things like that. Um, Next slide, thanks, Steve. So what's Arnett's uh, new model to support research? Well, over the last two or so years, Arnett's gone through a bit of a joy ride uh, in figuring out you know, what role we can play in this space. Uh, back in 2022, we sort of put out there that we would look towards provisioning compute and storage alongside other offerings in the sector. Um, we came to sort of the realization it's probably not a great idea to put out vanilla offerings uh, out there whilst there's it's a a competitive and uh, well-provisioned space by other providers in the sector, uh, particularly some of those that are on the panel today. Um, and what we've ch chosen to do is more take a bit of a strategy change and move away from provisioning sort of uh, vanilla sort of compute um, towards more support, um, directly supporting specific research needs and research communities, and in particular some groups like the BioCommons. Um, further to this, what we've done, and there may have been, you know, heard on the grapevine, Grapevine, and it's changed its uh, way of uh, viewing um, engagement with the research sector. Uh, we've made the research uh, course of functionality across the organisation rather than being its own little sort of um, stream of work on, on along the side. And now it's bread and butter to everything essentially that we do right through from network operations through to operations and engagement. In this case with the BioCommons, oh, sorry, back Steve. <laughs> yep, thanks. In this engagement here, we're looking to partner with um, domain-based engagements such as the BioCommons, grow and grow offerings to support the community and do things really at the enterprise grade, like what we've been known for with our network operations. And we really wanna leverage our network that we've got in the ground across Australia um, to really support data intensive science and ensure that you know um, services are, are provisioned accessible via the network so that people can get the best transfer rates across networks to where they need to, such as your pauses, your nectars and uh, NCIs and things for that matter. Next slide, thanks Steve. So Arnett's working towards, uh, with the BioCommons to operate the Galaxy head node on our infrastructure. Um, we'll be establishing a, a managed, um, managed platform as a service offering. Uh, that will be operated out of our data centres uh, here in Australia. And the focus will be really much supporting the operations of that head node um, and ensuring that it is well connected to support uh, the computational um, elements associated with the pulsars that are distributed across the country on other infrastructures. We're looking towards provisioning this so it's a 24 seven monitored service with high level of reliability and redundancy across, uh, across um, our data centres. Uh, and also is ensuring that it is all backed up and uh, has that redundancy infrastructure in place. 
the motivation behind this is really to leverage the network so that for data intense uh, sciences such as the bio, bio commons, we can leverage the network to move data where we need it over to computational elements and really uh, leverage that as the you know as a core part of the function out, uh, opportunity. And a lot of the uh, part around um, uh, the monitoring and ensuring that the surface has that high level of uptime is one of the major sort of goals behind this sort of initiative. Uh, we're a little bit behind schedule, I'll be honest. Um, uh, but what we're doing is we're looking to work with the BioCommons and Galaxy Australia to go for a launch in 2022 and work towards building a sustainable service offering post that um, so that we can continue to operate that ongoing. Um, this is, you know, really a we're wanting to work very closely with the with the community uh, to grow this um, and engage the current sector, but then also continue to grow that in Australia and out into other sort of sources as well. Uh, next slide, thanks, Steve. So beyond the Galaxy um, sort of um, managed platforms of service offering that we're looking to support Galaxy, we've got other engagements there that are relevant to the BioCommons and uh, uh, BBA, uh, particularly. Um, one of the other work, pieces of work that we're involved in at the moment is the BYOD, Bring, Bring Your Own Data Initiative. Um, we're a partner in this, in this AIDC funded effort. Um, and it's been a great opportunity for us, particularly because uh, it's uh, one of the things that's kind of, I suppose, to our bread and butter, which is around data movement and getting data out of laboratories into an analysis uh, form, um, analysis environments such as Unectors and uh, Pauses and NCIs. Um, our involvement is primarily around sort of aiding that uh, getting the data from the labs out to where it needs to be. And it involves things such as uh, the, uh, the well-known tool CloudStore, um, and also something that we're trialling at the moment out in the research and education sector, Globus, as a potential tool to help aid in the transfer of data to places where, where it's needed. We're keen to work with BioCommons to support the laboratories um, funded through BPA and assisting in data where it's needed. Um, and it's also from our perspective, and I'll be honest, we, we get a little bit out of this because it's really helping us guide us uh, where we take CloudStore. And as, as you would have known, if you were at the recent e-research conference, we're looking at relaunching CloudStore as a, a new implementation uh, later in 2022. Um, because some of the feedback that we've had, it's a dated system, it needs uh, revisiting. Um, and whoops, sorry, I'm being gonged. Um, and ultimately, um, we're looking towards ensuring that uh, the system that we deploy out in 2022 meets the needs of the community, such as the BioCommons and their um, uh, data transfer needs and storage. Other efforts that we've got of interest are particularly the CI login effort there around authorization. Um, and we've got an ongoing conversation there with the Arcos container, container community uh, around potentially hosting registry technologies over at Arnet. And I, I know Carmel's online there, so that uh, conversation, I think, keen for us to continue that one, particularly because I think, see there's benefit there for uh, the BioCommons community. Uh, next, next slide, Steve. Uh, there you go. So look, uh, we're really excited about this engagement, keen to continue to work with the BioCommons, and I'll leave it at that, so I'm under time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan, and thank you very much for keeping the time. So um, over to Carmel, who I'd like to introduce, um, who is the Director of eResearch Infrastructure and Services from the Australian Research Data Commons. Over to you. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, Ryan. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present today. Um, so if we can go to the first slide, please. So um, I wanted to just give you a little bit of background about the Australian Research Data Commons, ARDC. So that's us on a page, really. Um, basically, we're across the whole research lifecycle and we have a national focus. And we are fully funded by um, INCRIS and um, we co-invest um, to develop platforms and compute across the whole ecosystem. Um, I'm the Director of Storage and Compute, so providing the foundational infrastructure with the research, the Nectar Research Cloud, and also with data retention. And the next slide, please. So this is just a quick overview of the ARDC Nectar Research Cloud. Uh, important to note that there is a federation, and that's our federation partners there across Australia and New Zealand. Um, we completed a refresh of our core infrastructure um, in July this year, so it's a little delayed by COVID and procurement issues. Um, but what it resulted in is us being able to double our national capacity. And the next slide. 
Uh, this is just an overview of the impact that the Nectar Research Cloud has had um, on Australian research since 2012. And just to point out as well that we are hosting about 20 platforms, they were um, formerly called virtual laboratories, but also we um, have projects across all the research fields in Australia. And the next slide. And here, this just gives you a bit of a taste of how we do support our NCRIS colleagues, which is Bio Commons, but also um, the number of platforms that we support as well. So you see Galaxy Australia there as well. And the next page. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about our partnership with Bio Commons. So the next slide. We've had a very long term partnership with BioCommons. Um, so, first, um, in relation to Nectar, Galaxy Australia was developed and has been hosted on Nectar since 2012. Um, obviously, Galaxy Australia has been very successful. So, we're very excited that um, the hit node will move over to our net. Um, but we also have been investing in increasing the cloud computing capacity. And in the last year, we've made a significant investment in new infrastructure with large memory machines. And there, there are some details about the impact that that has had so far on, on Galaxy Australia. Also, um, our ARDC in general and Nectar Research Cloud has continued to invest in BioCommons initiatives um, over the last few years, um, which Ryan mentioned um, some of the um, partnerships there. And last but not least, uh, we have been investing significantly in cloud infrastructure um, nationally for the last couple of years. So we've invested over 8 million in our refresh and we've been investing 4 million plus in leading edge infrastructure at scale. And that leading edge infrastructure has been supporting the uh, uh, ARDC platforms that we talked about, our 2019 and 2020 platforms, which are great ac across um, many areas, such as um, sensitive e research platforms, machine learning, AI, life sciences, sciences eco commons, etc. And also, we play a big role in the national coordination and development of best practice of new technologies. So, um, Ryan mentioned ARCOS. Um, so Arnet, BioCommons, POSI, and Monash University, we're all partners in developing the Australian um, Research Containers and Orchestration Services and developing best practice on that. And yes, so we'll catch up with Ryan because we're looking at creating um, a proof of concept for that registry. And once that's developed on Nectar, looking at that long-term hosting. So what's next for our partnership? So next slide, please, Stephen. Um, what's next is we've been very keen to look at uh, multi-cloud and um, I think Stephen mentioned at the beginning and uh, one thing we're very keen on is to have that seamless experience for researchers so it's no longer the remit that researchers would use one type of compute or one type of cloud so we've been very keen to explore the benefits of commercial cloud for national research advantage so we're partnering with BioCommons, um, University of Sydney and UNSW on this initiative until June 2023. So that kind of gives you a sense of the why. Um, we wanted also with the why, there was a lot of, um, how would I say, there wasn't a lot of um, detailed research on when people use commercial cloud um, for research and um, when they were using Nectar and what would be the benefit. One of the areas that we did see was 24 seven support, but we felt that there was a lot more um, benefit beyond that. So that's where we've partnered with BioCommons to trial and test um, the use cases um, to see how we could use that. It's also part of that ARDC's multi-cloud strategy going forward, being a national research cloud provider. So the what is looking at these three areas to trial, to explore and to test. Um, so what we wanted to do was not reinvent the wheel, but work with University of Sydney, who has successfully created um, a service using Ronin and the AWS platform to create a commercial cloud um, service for their researchers. So we wanted to leverage that service and develop that service um, with a national um, slant. Um, we also want to explore newer technology and innovation at scale. So this is where we have the opportunity to work with UNSW um, to explore how to use microservices to tag and trace research metadata so we can define compute and storage usage and how we can workflow that through to the right type of compute. Um, so I will talk about the Biocoms use cases in a second. 
but where are we at? Um, so the when, we're still in our requirements gathering phase and we hope to have contracts um, ready by the end of 2021. And uh, we hope to have the pilot service up and running in 2023 to trial and test those use cases with BioCommons in the first instance. And then our intention is that we will have a um, complete analysis to see how those use cases have migrated over to commercial cloud, but also produce a national report that will allow us to know how to strategically invest in a multi-cloud future um, going forward. And then the next slide, please, Steve. So this is just a summary of the BioCommons use cases for commercial cloud. Um, one of the use cases, and excuse the numbering there, but they're all number one to me, those use cases. Um, but um, here is just to increase the general Galaxy Australia capacity, but also to ensure that we can reach the largest numbers of researchers possible. So not just to restrict ourselves to one type of compute platform, to expand it across multiple platforms. Um, also to provide specialized pipelines, create that BYO account service, um, integrate with institutional services, and then last but not least, um, curate our bioinformatics environments. So we're very much looking forward to continuing our close partnership with BioCommons. Um, thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, Carmel. All right, and I'd now like to hand over to Mark, who is the head of scientific computing at Pawsey. Thank you. Thanks, Steve, and uh, thanks, Carmel. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, yeah, so my name's uh, Mark Rowe. I'm the head of scientific platforms at Pawsey. And when I tell people what that means, uh, usually I just tell them, but it means I'm in charge of everything in the center with a blinky light, uh, which is quite a bit of stuff. Um, uh, over the last year, we've been uh, deploying and uh, helping uh, raise bioinformatics uptake at Pawsey and also uh, assisting with uh, kind of the underlying bioinformatics core infrastructure. Uh, and that's really part of the development of the, um, the emerging infrastructure uh, uh, that's being, it's coming from the bio cloud and this kind of notion really of a, a compute, um, a, a somewhat integrated compute infrastructure that's useful for bioinformaticians. At Pawsey, over the last year, uh, we've been supporting uh, Galaxy services and uh, and helping uh, the Galaxy infrastructure to operate while they um, while they're working with Arnet to get uh, the um, uh, more formal um, in, uh, infrastructure in place to uh, have an ongoing support for the Galaxy infrastructure. And it's been our pleasure to be able to help the Australian Research and Bioinformatics Infrastructure Scientists with uh, keeping that service running while uh, our proper home for that is kind of made available. But in the meantime, we've also been making available um, a Galaxy infrastructure uh, through, an, through a Pulsar service for uh, COVID specific work, which was part of the work that we kind of launched last year during the beginning of our kind of fund crisis that we're still work, living through. And, um, and we'll continue to be doing that um, in future as the uh, Galaxy service in Australia matures. But we're doing other things in the BioCommons as well. Um, earlier today, um, uh, we talked, uh, you heard about the Apollo service, which is just getting up and running now, um, where we're providing kind of compute infrastructure to help that get up and running. Um, and uh, we have an ongoing engagement uh, through the BYOD uh, project within the Bing Your Own Data project within the BioCommons, the command line interface project, which is really uh, serving to try and stitch together this uh, rather tricky part of the use of infrastructure, which is um, uh, the, the access for researchers into uh, what are uh, fundamentally quite uh, hard to use infrastructures, operating at our um, HPC infrastructures and others as well, and, uh, and really coming up with a, with a kind of from the ground up infrastructure to, to help researchers be able to access those in meaningful ways without having to be computational experts um, in all matters. And that's, that's the CLI project. And the other part of the BioCommons infrastructure and support at Pawsey is really just the, the general support that we're, as we're working through all that and working with um, customers in, at Pawsey that are doing bioinformatics. And, um, and that's building uh, the uh, staffing at Pawsey so that we actually have people um, who can uh, kind of um, talk to bioinformaticians on, an, on a kind of an equal basis. Um, it's very hard for me. Um, my, my background's in climate change and, and physics. Um, I'm not a very good bioinformatician, uh, but and so it's very important for us to have people who can um, actually uh, talk to bioinformatics and give us good advice on on what bioinformaticians really need in order to get their work done. And that's that's like an ongoing process really at Pawsey that uh, we're really at the beginning of, and which will be 
expanding further as we get into the next phase of our infrastructure, uh, which leads me to my next slide, Steve, if you don't mind. So we're involved in uh, a range of architectural uh, renewals at Pawsey, and it's really, this is all part of our huge capital refresh program that we're in the kind of last stage of now with the uh, start of service of our new supercomputer, uh, Satonix. The, uh, it's not the, the only architectural revision that's underway at Pawsey, and some of the architectural revisions that are underway are software and user facing, and some of them are hardware and not really user facing, but obviously users will be using them. So uh, the biggest part of our infrastructure, um, which people will be getting access to over the coming year is Satonix, our new supercomputer. Uh, the first part of that is on the floor right now at Pawsey, and it'll be getting up and running uh, for users uh, towards the end of this year and made available more formally in the new year. And then towards the middle of the year, 2022, we'll be getting our large GPU uh, cluster up and running and then getting people um, and research teams up and using on that. Uh, that. That will bring us to a net infrastructure of about 50 petaflops of um, compute, which is uh, just a number really, but um, it'll be uh, quite a significant improvement in the um, compute capacity at Pawsey. It's not our only infrastructure though. We're doing another large scale infrastructure deployment at Pawsey was our new object storage system. Um, and that when it's fully up and running will be roughly in its first stage, about a 60 petabyte object store made available to researchers who are doing work at Pawsey or just need to be able to share data uh, with, with other infrastructures. The, um, there's another aspect of our, um, of our uh, architectural rule, uh, uh, work at Pawsey and it really goes to uh, expanded access, and, and I'm kind of thinking that a bit um, broadly, not simply access mechanisms and ways that you apply for compute, although that is part of it, and in the new year we'll be talking more about additional access mechanisms for um, researchers, including bioinformaticians, to get access to Pawsey. Uh, NCMAS, of course, will be a large part of our work, but there will be other ways to get access to Pawsey. And in addition, you know, we had talked earlier uh, in, the, in the previous session about ABLES, and, and the way that uh, Bio for Commons is uh, the uh, Bio Commons is working directly with infrastructure in, uh, providers like NCI and Pawsey to create a, a really uh, well well targeted uh, compute infrastructure for bioinformaticians. But the other part of it is also uh, providing uh, different sets of tools for accessing the infrastructure, and that's uh, tools um, of the sort of Jupyter Hubs and Open on Demand, which we currently have kind of in. Um, in review at Pawsey, the kind of services that we'll be rolling out in the coming year and years, in fact, as we find better and more appropriate ways for people to access infrastructure. Um, uh, ironically, of course, you know, our work with the BioCommons and BYD project has ran command line interfaces, and I'm deliberately talking about undermining that by making new tools to make this access um, infrastructure easy to access, but that is kind of where we're headed. And then the last part of our architectural revision is really it's a software one, but it kind of ties into the way that researchers are using our infrastructure, and it's um, kind of a moving towards a, uh, a framework where we're really providing kind of um, a first-class support for containerized workflows at Pawsey and the underlying infrastructure to make all that work, uh, uh, which is um, uh, provided through Kubernetes, which is uh, a big part of our work at Pawsey and will be a huge part of our work going forwards, and it's part of our uh, motivation for being involved in the Arcos project and to helping um, both uh, the Kubernetes and the tiny uses of the infrastructure become normalized and um, widely available at Pawsey. Uh, Steve, that's the end of my uh, talk. I'm, I'm 50 seconds ahead, so you may grant that time to the next speaker, who I think is um, Sarah. Good luck. Mark, uh, thank you so much for that um, wonderful overview of uh, Pawsey and uh, activities related to BioCommons and the BioCloud. So I am just going to do a bit of screen rejigging here and do some sharing. So. Um, we're now going to move off the infrastructure side of things and we're going to move, um, I guess, more into the user experience side of the story, which is, I think, equally important within the BioCommons context. Um, we're going to sh start with a short video. Um, one of our collaborators, Dan Oxen, who heads up experience design at Deloitte, and then we'll be followed by a short talk uh, from Sarah Nisbet, who's the Associate Director of User Experience and support of the BioCommons. So Awesome. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be here. My name's Dan Oxton, and I'm a design director at Deloitte Digital. And I'm here to chat to you about user experience design. So I've been designing digital products and services for um, over 20 years. And 
some of the most fun work that I've done over that time has been when I've been given the opportunity to combine large data sets and large amounts of information and work with people to present that information in a really intuitive and engaging way. Um, my team and I have been recently working with the Bureau of Meteorology and there we've been helping them to, I guess, understand their customers from people like you or I who are you know, just trying to work out whether we need to take an umbrella to work um, through to pilots and captains of ships when they're trying to you know, work out uh, safe passage through the seas. And uh, we've been working with them to like, reimagine their various digital products um, and the overall experience that their customers are going to have. And that's one of the things I really love about design, right? It's the opportunity to work with organizations like yours to do just that, to combine customer information and create and design new products and services that people are gonna love using. So I'm here today to talk to you about why you can't live without UX. I'm gonna to talk to you about three key things, right? Why you need UX, what's involved in it, and how I think it's gonna benefit um, your organizations in this broader program. So let me tell you a quick story, right? I remember a few years ago, I was uh, working on a project with my team and we'd been really kind of pushing, you know, burning the candle at both ends, um, night and day working on this, piece of, this particular piece of software. And uh, I remember going to start my computer one day, turn it on, poof, nothing. And I pretty quickly worked out, I didn't have a backup uh, and I was gonna have to bring in a uh, forensic computing person to really just try and extract as much data as they could. And that was gonna cost me a, a fairly big chunk of change for them to do that. Needless to say, it was a pretty painful experience. And then I remember about a year later, this program came out called Dropbox. And I installed that program and almost overnight, it changed my, um, the way I related to information and files and data on my computer. I installed it and pretty much it seamlessly integrated with my computer, started backing everything up and um, it all just happened in the background. I didn't really have to think about it. I and mean, if I did need to use it, the way they designed it was using design patterns that I was used to, uh, iconography that was easy to understand and, and words and messages that I could really, that were intuitive. And for me, that's what good design is, right? Good design is about solving problems, right? It's not about designing a pretty inter interface. It's about the whole system that that interface exists within. It's not just about technology. It's about people's behaviors and context and, 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 and the goals that they have. It's about creating products and services that people are gonna love using. Now, if that sounds like something that's interesting for your organization, there's a couple of things you're gonna to need to do. To become a design-led organization, you're gonna to need to embed and change the mindsets of your team, and you're gonna to need to build capability. So what do I mean by mindsets? Well, if you're gonna foster a design mindset, you're gonna to need to really focus on what I think are the three key areas, right? The first one being building empathy. So understanding your customers. You're gonna to have to embed an exploratory mindset and enable your team to take risks and iteratively design things to come to a solution. And you're gonna to have to make sure that your objective and the purpose of the, of the things that you're designing are really on point and the team can truly understand what success looks like. Once you've done that, you'll need to start looking at capability and building capability, hiring or growing it within your team. And that capability is going to bring a series of uh, tools and um, frameworks and processes to, uh, to your organization. And a typical one is this double diamond. Uh, where a UX designer is going to take you through discovery, definition, development, and delivery, right? And in discovery, they're going to be really helping you and the team to understand your customer, um, to remove assumptions and biases that we all bring to um, problems when we're trying to solve them. Then they're going to be helping you in the define phase, really hone in on what is the core problem that you're trying to solve. Think about the Dropbox example. There they were basically fixing the problem around saving files and sharing files. They were the two key things that they set out to do. In the develop phase, your UX designers will help you iteratively design the solution and get to something that's really going to answer that problem. And finally, in the deliver phase, they'll be looking at collaborating and refining the solution with your development team, whoever that might be. So why is this critical to your team and why can't you live without UX? Basically, your team are gonna be investing a huge amount of time, energy, and money into creating this program. And if you really want that program to work, UX designers are, what, are what's gonna help because they're gonna help you and the team make something that is useful, 
That is, it's something that aligns to the customer problems and it's something that people want to use. They're going to make something that's usable, that's intuitive, that's easy to use. And they're going to make something that's accessible. And I, don't, I mean that both from a capability point of view for people who have disabilities through to people who have varying different types of workflows and systems that, that, that your solution needs to integrate with. So I've given you a bunch of information today about um, why I think UX design is crucial for you, for you and this program. The need to start embedding design mindsets in your organization and what they are. A quick overview of kind of UX design and the, and the frameworks and processes that people that they'll go through. But ultimately, if you're going to take one thing from, from this talk today, it's that UX design is the process that's going to enable you to connect with your customers to create products and services that they're really going to love using. So that's it. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. And if you want to get in touch, you can reach out to me at Dan O on Twitter. And uh, I look forward to chatting soon. All right, see ya. Thank you, Dan. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it to be live with us today. So he pre-recorded that uh, introduction to UX. Um, so I'll just get my share screen um, and Sarah up and running. Okay, over to you, Sarah. Hi, hi everyone. Hopefully you can see and hear me. Um, hi, my name's uh, Sarah. Um, I'm the Associate Director of User Experience and Support at the BioCommons. Uh, for those who are wondering, yes, I do have a role at BioPlatforms also, um, but today I'm here representing uh, the BioCommons. Um, wow, huge thank you to Dan for that great introduction to UX. Um, what a great talk and really highlights why we need it and um, and why we need to invest in it. Um, next slide, please, Steve. Um, so at the BioCommons, we have some really big goals. That's our little badge, number one. Woohoo! Um, we want to do great things uh, with the research community. And in a lot of instances, we already are. I think you've heard uh, yesterday uh, and today that the BioCommons is already making a real impact in researchers' work. Um, we're saving them time, helping them negotiate access to resources and creating a lot of efficiencies. Um, I think my internet is failing me. I'll just keep going. <laughs> um, and we want everyone to have really positive experiences like that and the ones that you've heard about. Um, slide, next slide, please. Um, so what's stopping us? We have the wheel. Um, so I guess for us, an emerging barrier is just the complexity of the biocommons. Um, one of our greatest strengths and achievements is our partnerships, as you've just heard in the previous session and even in this one. Um, it's enabling access uh, to researchers to an incredible range of infrastructures, services, and a real wealth of expertise. Um, however, with so many moving parts, partners, workflows, services, <laughs> uh, we need to work a little bit harder to ensure that a researcher or a user uh, has a consistent experience across all of these different moving parts. Uh, next slide, please, Steve. Um, so consistency, how do we make sure that everyone has a similar experience as they navigate uh, this landscape or the biocommons? Um, we want to ensure that the biocommons is resourced um, to provide excellent support experiences and consistency across all of our services. Um, who are the researchers going to call or email when they have an issue or something goes wrong? Um, is there documentation they can search? Uh, and where is that going to live on the Biocommons site or on our partner sites? Um, and what about when things break down between services? Um, we've been building a lot of our capability with very different communities in mind, um, but it's pretty reasonable to assume that um, these users will be looking to utilize um, more of the biocommons as uh, new services come on board and those services become more integrated and interoperable. So look, I think the answer is to establish um, some of these principles and even just recognize that this 
there is this complexity and we want to provide uh, that consistency um, and ensure those principles and supporting services uh, and that um, we build that in uh, when we create and bring new services online. And again, consistency is about consistently aiming high. You know, it's not about just creating a minimum service standard so that everything is just mediocre. <laughs> we want everything to be uh, excellent and amazing and really pleasing to the audience. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the uh, UX department um, is a fairly new function within the BioCommons. Um, but we've got a few ideas for some early activities that we'll be uh, looking at. Um, so I think the first one is to bring in some additional resources to support this. Um, we need expertise in the biocommons across both UX uh, and UI. And I think uh, embedding this thinking and expertise into new tool developments, tool developments is something we're both moving forward with and aiming towards. Um, also, uh, this is really where you come in. So the BioCommons isn't built for me or for Steve, uh, it's built for you. Um, so we really wanna work as closely as possible uh, with you, the research community, to understand your needs. Um, and we'll be doing that through uh, a lot of interaction and um, interviews and analysis of our existing services to understand your requirements and challenges. Um, we'll also be looking at some Galaxy UI improvements and taking a leadership role uh, in that. And also looking for a way, um, not looking for a way, but expanding the BioCommons audience through the BioPlatforms facility user network, all within the framework of sort of ensuring that consistency, maintaining the service standards and support standards. Um, so the last, just next slide, thanks Steve. And I'll just try and finish up in those 22 seconds and say, look, no pressure to win a Nobel Prize here, uh, but we're here to support you through your research project and the data life cycle to support you from end to end, from idea to impact. Um, we want to make life easier for you now and also help you with those transformative research questions and to enable your grand ideas. Uh, if you had a bioinformatician in your pocket, what could you achieve? Or as Dan said, how can we solve your problems? So please get in touch, tell us what you need. Uh, we have multiple avenues to make this happen. Um, so yeah, get in touch, we're here to help. Thank you, over. Thank you, Sarah, and um, and thank you, Dan, as well, for that um, change in uh, somewhat abrupt change in topic, um, and but equally important topic um, in how we engage with users. Um, We've got a bit of time for questions, and I, I guess, sorry for putting you on the spot, Sarah, but what do you think the Dropbox moment, a Dropbox moment might look like for bioinformatics infrastructure, given Dan's uh, sentiments and comments? Oh. <laughs> I think... And I'll open this question to the, to the panel as well, if anyone has any thoughts. Uh, uh, I mean, does it look like some of the examples we've had already with the Regent Honey Eater? Um, or do we still have a ways to go? You know, I think when we think about our personal lives and some fantastic user experiences we've had with apps and tools and they're just seamless, work fantastically. And I think, um, you know, there are some fantastic ambitions in looking to those examples for the biocommons to really think about, wow, change the way we think about biocommons as a service in the same way that, you know, <laughs> I guess web development used to be a fairly bespoke skill and you would have a web developer. And now with all of the explosion in sort of uh, services and tools, anybody can build a fantastic looking website. So, you know, is it realistic to assume that anybody can do a genome assembly? Or multi-omics even, imagine. Mark, did you, were you looking like you were gonna take yourself off mute? Uh, no, but I can. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm quite shy normally, so I don't like to talk. But um, yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure what the 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 Dropbox moments is. I think you know that the whole computation infrastructure is still uh, incredibly fragmented, right? It's it, and complex, and that's come up a couple of times today um, in in talks. And so, um, and I it doesn't 
uh, seem to be getting less complex. And I think part of the reason for that is that at, that at our level, at the technology level, we actually, we quite like the complexity, right? It's good fun actually. Um, and so, um, and, and we typically what we do is we make these complex things and then we try and jury rig um, a, a, an easier to use front end of it. And that's, uh, it's a kind of a bit of a backwards, backwards way of doing things. You know, um, I've done um, UX design myself in the past and it's, uh, you really want to, you, it, it's better to go the other way, start with a good UX interface and then, or UX concept and then build the back end infrastructure to match. So, but it's kind of not how we're doing it and, and we don't have a choice, you know, the, the infrastructure exists and we're, um, we're building it rapidly as we're also doing the other part. So um, I, I think it's, we're on, we're on the long road to, you know, not the short path to finding the, the good way the, the nice way to include everybody in the use of this infrastructure, but um, it's probably also I think it's the only way. So um, uh, because we've also got you know other work that needs to be done, and, and and a lot of the work that we're doing is you know urgent. So you know we can't wait for the perfect solution. We have to work with the thing that we've got, make it work as best we can, and then also identify where it where it um, where it diverges from what we'd like it to be, and and continue to just chip away at you know making it better. Yeah. Any other, um, uh, Carmel, you don't need to respond, but if you had a response, please. Um, yes, so I, I do actually. So um, we actually have just hired um, a web developer with um, UX experience because we're obviously um, developing a lot of new services, front-end services on Nectar. Um, but it was interesting, yeah, that uh, Dropbox moment or a uh, moment is um, also thinking about like you know being a national research cloud obviously um we deal with all the disciplines and stuff like that but all research is digital so we we want to have that balance of people being able to to do the research well without having that barrier to using computer using cloud or using the different services so it's trying to get that balance right and i always kind of see as that scale because there's also that balance of how do we ensure we're delivering, and I love that term you used, um, Sarah, is that consistency in your service um, and consistent excellence um, and that service provision, because we're all service providers. And how do you balance that with new technology that's coming on board and to be flexible and adaptable to new requirements from um, our research community? So that's kind of the balance that we're looking at at the moment. Um, yeah, that's for me. Thank you. And that's really interesting that you've yet invested in that sort of expertise and capability at that level. Um, all right. Well, we might uh, wrap up there a couple of minutes early. Uh, Ryan, did you have anything to add or? I was probably just going to say, yeah, uh, as, as like uh, Carmel's doing, we, I mean, we're doing a, uh, I suppose, a rebirth of cloud store at the moment. And so we're investing in a, a UX sort of a, a developer mm. as well, because our, mm. you know, our interfaces are quite um, mm. uh, dated, uh, you know, so it's something that, you know, we're looking at uh, seriously. Um, it is tr tricky. And I think, you know, Mark's a flag that there, you know, look, we, we you know, we're researchers de uh, dealing with infrastructure and effectively, you know, we like, we like the tricky, you know, but the tricky is always evolving and that's what excites us. So we probably put on the, the wayside, um, you know, the investment in the simplification for others <laughs> rather than, you know, seeing that need. Plus the other thing just sort of, uh, that's very meritorious is, you know, that research has, you know, it's becoming more of a group endeavor. It has always been an individualistic sort of endeavor, and you know everyone's sort of um, uh, uh, so it's a credit credit in or accreditation in sort of the uh, the research domain is a very individual sort of uh, um, viewpoint, um, and so everyone does everything differently. So it's quite quite challenging to come up with a the U Butte UX sort of design that services the broader spectrum. You know, um, and it's quite a tricky endeavor. Uh, and plus, then you know you're also got a I suppose um, constraints there from a, um, a budgetary perspective on how much you actually invest on these functionality. And um, so you've got all these sort of uh, forces that should be complementary, and I just got gonged, um, that, you know, uh, effectively compete against each other to get you that really nice uh, swish um, Dropbox sort of uh, moment. But um, I think there's a lot that we can learn from the commercial players out there that have a lot more available to invest. Hmm. Um, and leveraging, you know, there's no, there's no need there to fight against established patterns. Um, just sort of adopt some of those and try to apply them where most appropriate. You know, um, that's that's great. And um, and the dong was for all of us. So um, and look, uh, I, you know, I, I'm glad we talked about UX because now I know that there's investment happening across our partner network. 
Um, and, um, and, you know, I think this is the start of an ongoing conversation, given we're all interested and see the importance in this. So look, um, I'll just reshare my screen briefly. Um, just wanted to wrap up uh, for this BioCloud session. So a massive thank you to Ryan, to Carmel, Sarah, Mark, um, and, uh, and Dan. And of course, thank you to Christina and Mel who are working um, and, and Jeff working in the back end to make all this happen technically. Um, so thank you for coming to the BioCloud session. Also, thank you for coming to the three sessions today. Um, this is the wrap up of day two and we look forward to seeing you uh, for day three tomorrow. So thanks for coming. <laughs>